Hello everyone! We don't give a whole lot of love to the plants on this channel, thus today we're going to talk about them. So let's jump right in. I decided to make this video in large part because of a video of Frank Turek I saw on Vice Rhino's channel. According to Darwinism, do you know, and this isn't often talked about because Darwinists have no real idea of how this could occur, but we're related to plants too. While it's patently false that evolutionary biologists don't talk about plants, we don't do it much on this channel. As it happens though, we've mentioned before where plants fit in relation to us on the phylogenetic tree, as in Common Ancestry Part 5. Our common ancestor with plants lived around 1.6 billion years ago, not long after the formation of the domain Eukarya. That common ancestor wouldn't have appeared notably plant or animal-like, and trying to work out the phylogeny of eukaryotes that far back has been understandably a subject of controversy over the years, one which could occupy an entire video unto itself. For the purposes of this video, all you need to keep in mind is that plants are situated within the clade Diaphoretics, and within that, they are in the clade Archaeplastida, which is sister to the clade of protists called Chromista. An early Archaeplastid achieved endosymbiosis with a cyanobacterium, which eventually became the chloroplast. It's also important to note that many members of the sister group Chromista, as well as some other eukaryote lineages, also obtained chloroplasts themselves, either from independent endosymbiosis with cyanobacteria, such as is the case with Polynella, or they obtained them via endosymbiosis with another eukaryote that already had chloroplasts, what is known as secondary or even tertiary endosymbiosis. In that sense, the innards of cell organelles are a bit like nested Russian dolls. All that makes it trickier to work out deep relationships where surface morphology isn't always a guide. This is the case with photosynthetic chromists such as kelp. They may look like plants on the outside, but they are actually more closely related to plasmodium, the parasite that causes malaria, which, curiously, have chloroplast-derived plastids that are no longer capable of performing photosynthesis. Within Archaeplastida, we find Rhodophyta, the red algae, the mysterious unicellular Glaucophyta, and Veridi plantae, green algae and plants. Within Veridi plantae, we see a wide variety of basal lineages containing members that are adapted to terrestrial environments, in various degrees. Here we turn to the clade Streptophyta, containing the paraphyletic charophytes and Embryophyta. Embryophyta are the land plants, which first appeared in the Ordovician and currently contain bryophytes, lycopods, monilophytes, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. There! You just traveled from our common ancestor with plants to the plants you'd encounter in forests, fields, and gardens. So much for any creationist claim that we've no idea how we're related to plants. The diversity and evolutionary history of embryophytes could probably be covered in several videos, however we are going to quickly skim through them. Land plants divide into the paraphyletic group of bryophytes, or non-vascular plants, the liverworts, mosses, and hornworts, and the monophyletic group of vascular plants, the tracheophytes, which appeared in the Silurian. Basal lineages of vascular plants include the lycopods, such as quillworts, club mosses, and the extinct giant lycopod trees from the Carboniferous. Another basal lineage is the monilophytes, the horsetails and ferns that first appeared in the Devonian. The derived lineage of vascular plants is the clade Spermatophyta, the seed plants. Unlike the previously mentioned ferns that reproduce via spores produced on the underside of the fronds, Spermatophyta reproduce via the production of seeds. This clade first appeared in the Devonian in forms such as Teridospermatophyta, and bifurcates into modern gymnosperms and angiosperms. A 2011 paper by Zhao et al. proposes that a whole genome duplication event just prior to the origin of the spermatophytes diversified a number of regulatory genes important to the evolution of seed development. A later whole genome duplication just prior to the origin of angiosperms, probably in the late Jurassic, did the same for flower development. But before we get into the evolutionary history of flowering plants, it is important to understand what a flower is. Flowers are the reproductive structures of angiosperms, existing to facilitate the union of sperm and eggs. 
sometimes allowing self-fertilization by the fusion of egg and sperm from the same flower, or to promote outcrossing, often by attracting animals, causing them to transfer pollen from one flower to others. Insects ended up doing a lot of that job, uh, but in some cases, bats do it too. The male part of the flower, the stamen, has a structure called an anther, which contains pollen. The female part, the pistil, contains the stigma, style, and ovary. Pollen must get into the stigma, travel down the style, and enter the ovary to reach an egg. Once fertilization occurs, the ovules become seeds, and the ovary matures into a fruit. Interestingly, the same genes that control the development of cones and gymnosperms are also present in angiosperms, but here they are modified to shape and control the development of flowers. The elements of flowers, such as petals and sepals, as well as the stamen and carpels of the flower, are modified leaves. The pistil in particular is often composed of carpels, which are thought to be derived from flat, leaf-like structures that had ovules on their margins. These later folded inward and fused at the edges, forming a hollow, enclosed structure that protects the ovules. This scenario is supported by Amborella, a single species of flowering plant that is sister to all other angiosperms. It also has carpels, but these aren't fused with tissues. The seam is sealed with a sticky secretion from the carpel. Flowers themselves often form clusters on the plant which are called inflorescence, the branching pattern of which varies widely between different groups. Sometimes the flowers can be arranged in a very tight cluster, such that they are often falsely recognized as one single flower. This is especially the case with members of the family Asteraceae, such as sunflowers. They are actually composites of many disc flowers at the center that's surrounded by a ring of petals bearing ray flowers. Another example is the Araceae family, which includes the common houseplant Anthurium that have tiny flowers densely packed on a fleshy stem called a spadix, which is surrounded by what looks like a single colorful petal, but is actually a different specialized leaf called a bract. But no inflorescence is as modified as those of figs. Their flowers grow on the inside surface of a hollow receptacle with one tiny opening at the anterior end. This structure is the result of a complex coevolutionary relationship with a specific group of pollinating wasps. Now, despite the strong genetic linkage between the spermatophytes, fossils have been rather problematic, where the geological mechanisms of fossilization aren't especially friendly to preserving plant bits that can wither and rot so quickly as florists and gardeners are well aware. As mentioned earlier, gymnosperms and angiosperms are sisters. However, the earliest known gymnosperms date to the Carboniferous, while the earliest known angiosperms date to the early Cretaceous. The lack of angiosperm fossil ancestors troubled even Darwin, who called their evolution an abominable mystery, which, quote, has naturally been relentlessly mined by creationists ever since. Of course, genetics and fossils since Darwin's time have rooted both spermatophytes, but there are still issues in their shared phylogeny. For example, morphological studies of extant spermatophytes have tended to link Nidophyta, which is Nidum, Welwitschia, and Ephydra, with the angiosperms, forming the anthophyte clade. But this relationship seems to be an artifact of convergent evolution between the groups. Recent phylogenetic studies tend to agree that Nidophyta is sister to Pinaceae, the pine trees, both being a subset of conifers. Cycads and ginkgos are then sister to the conifers, all gymnosperms. But, since the first gymnosperms are found in the Carboniferous, their common ancestor with angiosperms must logically be at least that old. Historically, even in some recent studies, the angiosperms have been placed as either sister to Nidophyta or a clade of flower-like plants called Venetitales, or both. Even as recently as 2007, Nidophyta, along with the Venetitales, was placed as sister to the angiosperms based on their morphological similarities, in addition to some charcoalified Cretaceous seeds. But we've seen how misleading relying too much on morphology can be, and, as mentioned previously, the pairing of nidophytes with angiosperms is refuted by molecular data. Regardless of earlier confusion, one study combining morphology with genetics concluded that there is strong support from both for the placement of nidophyta within the conifers. What about the Benetitales? This clade of plants existed from the Permian to the end of the Paleogene, about 252 to 23 million years ago, and contains some well-known members like Williamsonia. Numerous studies over the years have placed this clade as close to the angiosperms due to their flower-like reproductive structures. While probably not directly ancestral to angiosperms, the presence of oleonane, a chemical found in woody angiosperms, 
has been detected in Vinitetales, strengthening their relationship to angiosperms on the basis of this shared biological component. A number of other clades are considered closely related to angiosperms, including Glossopteridales, Pentoxylales, and Gigantopteriales. The first was an extremely widespread plant clade during the Permian, because getting from continent to continent back then was a lot easier, since all the southern continents were squashed into Gondwana. Some of its features suggest a relationship to angiosperms, while others have caused it to be interpreted as being rather distantly related. Pentoxylales have a similar story. Heated debate rages over whether or not it shares a close tie with the angiosperms. Third, Gigantopteriales also bear the presence of oleanane, leading researchers to place angiosperms, benetitales, and Gigantopteriales close together. Focusing on angiosperms themselves, we have fossils such as Archaefructus, Neofructus, Sinocarpus, and Nothodicocarpum, all from the Ixian formation from the early Cretaceous, one of those Lagerstaaten class of deposits capable of preserving the fine details of plants, along with feathered dinosaurs. Although their relationship to modern angiosperms are often not clear, some of them, such as Sinocarpus, appear to be advanced forms of angiosperms. When Archaefructus was described in 2002, it was considered to be part of a basal lineage, sister to all extant angiosperms. Other researchers have criticized this conclusion. There are also disputed angiosperm fossils dating from the Jurassic period, such as Nanjing Anthus, but the earliest unambiguous fossil evidence of angiosperms are exclusive to the early Cretaceous. However, there is other evidence to suggest that angiosperms originated much earlier. In a recent study published in May 2019, Lee et al. constructed a phylogenetic tree, which was then used along with the molecular clock and fossils as calibration nodes to date the angiosperm crown group to the upper Triassic, almost 70 million years earlier than the earliest definitive angiosperms from the fossil record. This difference between molecular and fossil dates was named the Jurassic Angiosperm Gap. The authors noted that their date for the early diversification of angiosperms corresponds with the origin of several major groups of insects, including crickets, katydids, alderflies, and the ancestors of caddisflies, moths, and butterflies. But the massive radiation of angiosperms, for which we do have evidence from the fossil record, occurred in the Cretaceous, coinciding with the expansion of pollinating insects like bees, butterflies, moths, and beetles, most notably those that feed on plants. This diversification climaxed in what is known as the Cretaceous Terrestrial Revolution, or KTR, the K coming from how Cretaceous is spelled in German. It was then when angiosperms not only became highly diverse, but also established ecological dominance as the most prevalent type of flora. This also affected many other animal groups, not just insects, as the KTR event also included intense diversification of squamates, turtles, birds, and therian mammals. In another recent paper, researchers dispelled the common notion that mammals didn't do much during the time of the dinosaurs. Several mammalian groups underwent adaptive radiations, especially during the KTR, which is linked to the diversification of angiosperms. These new mammals benefited from angiosperms in many ways, such as providing novel food sources in the form of fruits and seeds which also benefited angiosperms in return as mammals spread the seeds to new areas. This tight relationship means that without angiosperms, mammals that depend on them, especially those heavily reliant on fruit like our primate ancestors, likely would have never come to exist. Birds too were diversifying during the Cretaceous, and we know how birds today help spread seeds they eat in their droppings. Looking at the diversification of angiosperms themselves, the first burst of biodiversity occurred in magnoliids at the start of the Cretaceous period. After them, angiosperms are broken into two main groups based on the number of embryonic leaves they have, the single-leafed monocotyledons monocots, and the twin-leafed eudicotyledons eudicots. Most monocots are grouped in orchids, grasses, sedges, and palms, while the eudicots comprise the vast majority of angiosperms, being some 75% of their biodiversity. That includes roses, tulips, fruit and vegetable producing plants, and even some of the strangest plants of all, such as the carnivorous pitcher plants and Venus flytraps. Pitcher plants, though they have arisen multiple times independently, probably followed similar evolutionary routes to their modern state. They likely began with leaves covered on top with sticky digestive fluids, like the modern Mexican Pinguicula canzati. Over time, the pitcher leaf became cupped deeper and deeper, decreasing the likelihood that its prey could escape. 
Venus flytraps, though, have a snap trap mechanism, so their evolutionary history is quite different. Researchers have proposed these steps as part of the flytrap's evolutionary transition. 1. Modification of responses to prey, including directed movements of tentacles and leaves to increase adhesion and engulf prey. 2. Acceleration of the rapidity with which prey are detected and the message is transmitted. 3. Evolution of structures to quickly close the trap and engulf prey. 4. Tuning of these responses to only respond to real and suitable prey. 5. Modification of the structure of marginal tentacles to create longer and more widely spaced marginal teeth to retain prey. 6. Modification of other tentacles to act as trigger sensory hairs. And 7. Loss of sticky glands from these tentacles and evolution of recessed digestive glands. What exactly caused angiosperms to be so prolific? Researchers have hypothesized that climate change and mutualisms with insects help drive the angiosperms' adaptive radiation. The stepwise radiation of early Cretaceous angiosperms has been directly correlated with major climatic and oceanographic perturbations. Next, because flowers appeared in the early Cretaceous, that means they predate bees, although hymenopteran relatives of bees have been buzzing around since the Triassic. Prior to angiosperms' symbiotic relationship with certain insects, pollen was dispersed originally by wind, as many still use, including other plants like the helicopter-like field maple seeds. Wind is obviously not a very reliable pollinator, so plants, such as conifers, compensate for it by releasing pollen in massive numbers to ensure successful fertilization. This is incredibly wasteful, as most pollen just won't come even close to the stigma of another plant. They land on the ground, or in water, or rivers and lakes, or end up inside the nasal cavity of some allergic terrestrial vertebrate. Angiosperms, on the other hand, often rely on insects, which is a more efficient pollination strategy and is likely one reason why angiosperms are more successful than gymnosperms. Although probably not the only reason, since there are gymnosperms that also rely on pollination, like cycads, and there are also angiosperms that have switched from insect to wind pollination, such as grasses. These have inconspicuous flowers as a result of this reversion to wind pollination, but they are still highly successful nonetheless. This transition from wind to insect pollination or vice versa doesn't appear to be very difficult, as there are plants that can rely on both methods to varying degrees. Some species of cycads in the basal angiosperm Amborella, to name a few. The interdependent relationship between pollinators and flowers is often put forward by creationists as a chicken or the egg problem for evolution. However, here we see that seed plants relied on wind first, and angiosperms came to rely increasingly on insect pollination when more and more specialized pollinators evolved, such as butterflies and bees, at which point the insects and plants are linked on a co-evolutionary treadmill. Bees in particular evolved from predatory wasps and later switched from prey to pollen during their evolution, which was covered in the video on wasp evolution. Of course, highly specialized pollinators like bees and butterflies weren't the first pollinators. Interestingly, caligramatted lacewings were fulfilling the roles of butterflies 165 to 120 million years ago, but for gymnosperms and benetitales rather than angiosperms. Even convergently evolving uh, wing eye spots, wing scales, and a tubular proboscis like butterflies. As for angiosperms, their mutualistic relationships with hymenopterans and lepidopterans, moths and butterflies, drove the origin of a number of structures. Flowers likely develop nectar and fragrant fumes to entice insects to accidentally disperse their pollen. It has been hypothesized that these volatiles that attract pollinators paradoxically evolved from herbivore deterrents. Thus, angiosperms had to compete against each other for the insect's attention, driving an adaptive radiation often resulting in flowers being specialized to be highly attractive to certain groups or even a single species of insects. Flowers like the bee orchid took this relationship to an extreme. It even looks like a bee. So, while there are still questions about the exact relationships among spermatophytes, the general systematics have been worked out. Darwin's abominable mystery has been largely solved. True angiosperms appeared in the late Mesozoic and took over in the Cenozoic. And without their endless and most beautiful forms that give nature its most flamboyant colors, we likely wouldn't be here to observe nature at all. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.